welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe podcast with our whole investment committee sitting here bright and early on a Monday morning. Markets have reopened. Uh, we are into the last week of September, and with that, the last week of Q3. And by the end of the week, I'll do a Dividend Cafe podcast to summarize kind of this week in the market, update you on Fed, trade war, uh, all sorts of things. But right now, we're going to take another particular topic. You may recall the last time that we all got together where I was sitting here, we talked about this uh, debate between passive and active investing, what it means at the Bonson Group, how we approach the subject. And we want to continue in that theme of taking different topics that we think are important for investors to understand and allow our investment committee to have kind of a live discussion around those different topics and uh, see if it might be something that our listeners uh, benefit from, a chance for us to share our particular philosophies around different topics uh, sometimes we'll have dissent amongst the five of us on a given issue, but we'll kind of podcast our way through different issues. And today we have a particular one that we're going to uh, go through. And that issue, that topic, will be the role that index funds are now playing in the market. And there's going to be a whole lot of different angles, nuances we can approach. But first, let me bring in the whole team here, our investment committee. I'll start with Brian Seitel sitting on my left. Brian, how was your weekend? It was fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Nice day of football watching yesterday with the family. So yeah. can't complain. Pretty pretty good day of football. Uh, Julian, welcome. Uh, how are you doing? Good, thank you. Uh, did Very you watch good. a lot of football yesterday? No, no football for me. I watched the Rugby World Cup, but it's like uh, in Japan, so it's like uh, terrible time, like midnight, 2 a.m., so I can't really watch it. I just watched the summary after. <laughs> Yeah, I actually, at midnight to 2 a.m., was doing the same thing I would have been doing if I had been watching rugby and not just sleeping. <laughs> so <laughs> it worked out just fine. Uh, Dea, welcome. How are you doing? Uh, doing, doing good. Uh, what did I do over the weekend? Oh, I had, It's never uh, a good uh, sign uh, if you yeah. don't remember. I had my <laughs> last my last, uh, my last last sailing lesson. Uh, it, was, it was supposed to be my last sailing lesson, but the instructor said uh, I wasn't good enough, and I have to take another sailing lesson. Yeah, so. well, that's well, good to find that yeah, out in yeah. the classroom first, yes. though. You know, <laughs> so, like, yeah, well, truth telling. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so hope I'll get that. I'll, I'll be able to be able to charter those waters in uh, in no time, but uh, but but not until the next lesson. So, uh, my only request is that you remain a better trader and analyst <laughs> than a than a uh, a sailor. <laughs> yeah, you don't want well, your 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 investment team being real good at sailing. Well, that's why it's because I was <laughs> I was doing so much investing in analytics, I didn't have time for the sailing. Which, there you go. Uh, I mean, okay. Mm-hmm. So yeah. uh, clearly, clearly that. that no, I always nice. encourage clients to check out my handicap because I, if they're ever worried about me spending too much time on the golf course, <laughs> they'll quickly realize. Yeah. But I've played with you before where I was a little worried, like, oh, Dea's a little too good at golf. That's not a good sign. And then I've played another time where I'm like, no, nah, he's like appropriately like mid-level, you know. Dea's golf game is like a guy who's a good golfer who doesn't play that much anymore. Uh-huh. Right. Is right. that a fair way to put yeah, it? That's yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. And my golf game is like a bad golfer who doesn't play that much. So it all works out. Me too. Uh, Robert, how you doing? How's your weekend? Hey, it was good. I just thought a lot about index funds, actually. Did so, you really? Yeah, yeah. roll. Well, I've, th- I've thought about it a lot for many, many years now, and we're going to kind of set the table a little so clients know what we're talking about. The debate is actually not uh, a, a repeat of what we just talked about a couple weeks ago, which is passive investing. But, of course, index funds essentially are a way to uh, go capture passive investing. And so you could either use what's called an ETF, an exchange-traded fund, which is a stock that is a basket of, of stocks, a uh, basket of securities meant to replicate a given index, and it trades like a stock on an exchange. You get a more favorable tax treatment. You have intraday liquidity. There's different pros to it, generally low expense structure, things like that. Um, And then, of course, there are index mutual funds, which have been around a very long time. Vanguard was a huge kind of pioneer in this space. Mm-hmm. And 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 they would really trade and function exactly like a regular mutual fund. You're going to get the pricing at the end of the day, and you're going to buy or sell at the closing day's price. Um, it gets taxed the same way a mutual fund does, and and uh, so there's you know pros and cons to to that as well. But what we're not meaning when we bring up the topic today of index investing is the pros and cons around being passive in a given asset class which I think we really well covered and kind of talked in our strategic versus tactical discussion a couple weeks ago. What we more want to talk about is the possibility, Brian, I'll start with you, 
that the market itself and an investor's experience in the stock market is theoretically going to look a lot different because of the fact that there's so much more index ownership, that there is such a massive volume. Is $5 trillion an okay number to use? Something like that. Uh, yeah. That the index base has gone to. Obviously, you can round up or down a little bit. But more or less, when you and I entered the business close to 20 years ago, we were looking at about a trillion in various passive strategies, the vast majority not in ETFs. Now you're sitting at $5 trillion, Okay, so you've had a 500% increase. And there's a school of thought out there that there is a big unknown as to, well, how much this volume going into index funds affects future market issues. Uh, before we go into unpacking what could be a threat and not be a threat— just generally speaking, is there systemic risk in the popularity of index funds? Systemic risk? Um, I don't think so personally, no. I mean, I think index funds are the constituents of which are the you know usually weighted by market cap, the largest stocks that are out there. They're pretty liquid instruments. You can analyze them pretty well, so you know the fundamentals. So as far as a, system, a systemic risk, where the whole market would kind of come off you know, come apart um, because of some sort of downturn because of just exchange traded funds. I, I, I think it'd be a stretch to kind of, you know, to try to pull that one together. Um, I think you could have maybe some larger stocks become overvalued just because half the flows into equities at this point are going into index type passive products, and so you're driving up those large stocks on the top end of the index a little bit, but still. You still have fundamentals that you can look at and say, well, you know, some of those, you know, top four big tech companies that make up about 13% of the S&P 500, you still sort of know what they're earning and, and you can still analyze them. And there's still a whole lot of money chasing and, and setting prices for price discovery outside of an index fund, too. But, so. what, but even backing up a minute, Julian, why would there not why would it not cut both ways? For every buyer, you, these stocks may be higher weighting within the index than they used to be, and therefore more volume, but there's got to be buyers and sellers, right? Well, uh, there's the, I guess, the flows and there's the trading. It's two very different things. Okay. Uh, I've done, you know, I have a lot of research here that I've done uh, the last few days just on the topic. And if you look at the trading, it's still 95 95% of the trading done on the market is from active managers. So even though the passive investing is now 40% of the market, it's money that's you know being invested for the long term, and that's not really traded. So the price so let me let me if you don't mind make uh, a clarification sure. for listeners on mm -hmm. what you're getting at. I think what you're saying is of the ownership. Index funds, maybe let's call it 40% of yeah. ownership, but of trading volume, it's only 5%. Exactly. So the trading is still done mostly by active managers. So the price discovery is still done by active managers. And these um, these index funds, they are simply owning stocks in a proportion that all the active investors are owning. So I don't see necessarily um, a real um, issue when we're at 40%. If we, are, if we go to 90%, then it's different. But we are still very far away from that. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's a really helpful distinction. And so what you would say is that the trading volume is so insignificant that there isn't systemic risk coming out of that as a as just merely because of broad ownership uh, index funds have in the market. Th th that's right. And also the trading volume being historically much higher these days than it used to be. It's like another data that I found like uh, 50 years ago you would have 3 million shares trading volume on the all of uh, NYSE. And today you have um, you have 26 million shares in just Apple in one day. So like the liquidity is just amazing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that's another factor that helps, uh, you know, market efficiency. So I think markets are more efficient today than they've probably ever been. Um, Dea, do you believe that the entire conversation of index funds and te and potential technical or mechanical complexity they bring into the market concerns some investors. Let's say you're an investor at the Bonson mm -hmm. Group or one of the five of us here at this table, and we are buying stocks in our portfolio on an individual basis. And so that makes us two things. A, um, not invested in index funds, but B, uh, invested in the market that does have a lot of index fund representation. Do we have anything to be concerned about by the fact that index funds have taken on this heavier percentage of market ownership? Uh, the short answer is absolutely not. And if anything, I think we should welcome uh, essentially what has been one of the great revolutions in finance 
and that is the rise of passive investing. And I just want to make this clear uh, as far as the uh, listeners go. When we say passive investing, index investing, we're talking about any sort of investing that does not have the human element in it. But active management, on the other hand, does have the human element. There's actually somebody deciding whether or not a security is entering that basket or exiting that basket. Uh, very much what we do here at the Bonds Group. You have people to get to get together. There's an investment committee. There's deliberating. People are looking at fundamental analysis, and uh, there's may, maybe uh, there's a little bit of discussion around what what gets added. So that human element is that distinction that we're talking about. Uh, and as far as do we have anything to worry about as far as the passive, uh, the rise of passive uh, investing in index or index investing, and we're using this anonymously. Uh, no, I don't think we have anything to worry about. I think it's it can make active managers look bad when there's a, a melt up in the market, and there's a limited amount of dispersion, and good stocks and bad stocks are going up at the same rate because money is just entering passive vehicles. Uh, so, in that sense, it can make make an active manager uh, look bad because it's not it's not uh, giving them credit for picking the good names that they own versus the bad name. But on the other side of things, when there's a large sell off. And uh, and dispersion is limited, and the baby's getting thrown out with the bathwater, so to speak. Bad stocks and good stocks are getting sold off at the same rate. It can present some opportunities for some bargains for an active manager, uh, especially if your active manager is able to hold some cash on the sidelines. So, I look. I think it it, it presents the potential for a systemic kind of mispricing, which is uh, which is a, a really good thing if you're an active manager. So, so I I I like the as far as the trends go and pa passive uh, index fund investing, that that's a trend that I welcome. So, Robert, I, I am going to ask you this question because I have, it looks like Julian has all these notes and he'll be able to cheat if I direct it to him. <laughs> I'm going to try to catch you maybe off guard. But you have um, – we're not going to go into any individual names or anything, but you have this so-called FANG acronym and couple – there's even a couple non-FANG names that might fit into this. But you may recall from a Dividend Cafe I wrote last year – that uh, and I don't know exactly where these numbers check right now, but I don't believe it's varied much. There's something in the range of five companies mm -hmm. that had a market capitalization equal to the bottom 250 companies. It was actually 243 mm -hmm. in the S and P 500. Um, my question is: Do you believe that that is a historical? Is that a new phenomena? And I will confess before that I know the answer. <laughs> Uh, I do think that it's different than in the past, but I think in the past there have been companies that have had similarly high weightings, but not to the degree and the concentration these days. Um, can I jump in and maybe take yeah. a counterpoint to what's been said here? So Julian said, said something really interesting and Dave followed up too about efficiency in the markets, right? And when you talk about efficiency from maybe a bid-ask spread component, the volumes and the flows in the past have certainly been beneficial in that regard. But I find a great irony in these index funds and these passive investments because to some extent you're blindly throwing capital at a lot of companies just because they happen to be a constituent of an index, right? Mm -hmm. And so that in and of itself kind of presents opportunities for active managers to go find those opportunities. So if you believe in efficient markets and you say, hey, I'll just, I won't fight the, the flow and I'll go into passive, you're, you're actually doing the reverse of what you believe in. You're making markets to an extent less efficient and more beneficial for active managers down the road, right? And I, so I... I, I, well, I yeah. You're investing off of a model, not off of fundamentals. Yeah, essentially. That, that's, you're, that's you're putting right. money into a market cap weighted index. Essentially, that's, that's right. So and price discovery can be skewed. Yeah, and and also just a philosophical point too. It you know I, I happen to think that to an extent the concentration of voting power in a lot of these bigger firms. I'm not going to name any. It's maybe bad for capitalism. Okay, well let's yeah. come. Let, let's yeah. do this. That is a very important topic, yeah. and that is really what people ought to be talking about. And we're going to come back ah, to yeah. that. Um, because it's a real, it's a great angle on it. So let's let's readdress that. Yeah. Um, within the context of cap weighting, so let me first give a quick little tutorial for our listeners. If you look at the the Dow Jones, it is rather bizarrely a summary of all the stocks in their index, or thirty of them, weighted according to the price of the stock. And so you have, if you have a, a stock that is around three hundred dollars a share, and it goes up five percent, it affects their index a lot more than if you have a stock that's fifty dollars a share that goes up five percent. It actually affects it six times more because of math. Now you could argue, well, that seems horribly inefficient. Why would it matter what the price of these stocks is? 
and it would be really distortive to have that kind of alteration. Yet the fact of the matter is, uh, even though I agree with that criticism of price-weighted indices, over time it's absolutely remarkable how much they end up correlating with cap-weighted indexes. And by cap-weighted, which is the way the S&P 500 is constructed, most of the Russell indexes and so forth, is that you take the market capitalization of the company, the value of the overall business. And so let's say you had an index of two stocks. One was worth uh, $900 billion and one was worth $100 billion. Then it would be the index would be nine parts the first stock and, sec and one part the second stock. So to the question I'd posed to Robert, we did have this phenomenon where you have five companies, real, mo, big tech, new tech, high cap companies, and and um, it, it's Fang with a couple more. Uh, one Fang name is not in it. One non-Fang name is in it. You get mm -hmm, the idea. Mm -hmm. um, it represents this huge portion. So I was absolutely shocked to find out that, um, no, it is actually – not the highest distortion of weighting. In 1999, we were far more focused within just five companies. That makes sense. And in fact, the top 40 companies were two times the weighting of the S&P that the top 40 companies are now. So the, the dis differential between top five then and top five now was not quite as exaggerated, but you know, the tech boom and valuations at the end of 1999 were, were Did, did that concentration persist for as long as this thing? Has, do you think? Do you recall? Uh, well, it certainly didn't persist yeah, past well, March yeah, uh, 2000. 2000. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you talk about a month that will live in infamy. That's a good no, point, the Nasdaq though. giving back. The, it did not. It did mm. not. And by the way, either did the Fang. During Q4, mm. a lot of the market disruption. Far, you had an index that went down 14.4 percent. Yeah. You had an average name in the index down 11 percent. Mm -hmm. You had Fang down 25 yeah. percent. Yeah. So it did realign a little bit. And, and even and even this year, you know, what's been a really good year for the market, Fang has dramatically underperformed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just going to say, that, and that's a great point. You know, you have what you were talking about earlier as potential kind of market dislocation. Money is coming into a model, is going into an index based on a list of market cap weighted names. Maybe that causes things to become overvalued. Maybe in the '90s, late '90s. Maybe you could argue Fang, and then you get just like you said, fourth quarter, you know, Q4 last year. You get kind of reversion to the mean, and you get price discovery, and that's why I think, while you do get anomalies like that, I, I do think with a pretty liquid and pretty, you know, um, liquid market, I think you get price discovery pretty. But, well. but Julian, isn't it true that intraday? There could be enhanced volatility risk around one of those high cap weighted names that they're more subject to a whipsaw in in a big sudden bout of intraday volatility. Um, I guess intraday, uh, yes, but I guess it's probably irrelevant to most investors uh, an intraday here, here. move, right? It's it, it's it's irrelevant to the five of us and all of the clients of the five of us. But if someone thinks they're going to go trade around it, they potentially have some sort of trading risk in, in theory. That, yeah, no, no, that, that's right. I mean, I guess I, um, you know, this whole debate, I, I guess, was restarted or like recently by, uh, you know, Michael Burry, the guy who wrote The Big Shot. No. And so I, I wanted to see exactly what he wrote. So I just, I, I, you know, I found well, a few Well, hold on. He didn't write The Big Short. Michael yeah. Lewis wrote The Big Short, but Michael, Michael Burry, Burry was yeah. one of the characters yeah. in The Big yeah. Short. But Michael yeah. Burry is now the, I guess, I mean, they're talking about, uh, so, you know, index uh Funds uh, being a new toxic CDOs, but then if you look at the, you know, uh, in more details what he's writing, actually the first thing he says, which is is actually even more probably more interesting, he says central banks and Basel three have more or less removed price discovery from the credit market, and and uh, meaning risk does not uh, have an accurate pricing mechanism in interest rate anymore. So he's just saying basically central banks are removed, and they probably haven't removed, but they're clearly distorting the the credit market. Well, okay. So we agree with that a thousand percent. I've talked yeah. about it almost every week of my life yeah. for 10 yeah. years. Um, the but, Fed has distorted risk in credit markets. But that means, What does that have to do with equity index funds? Well, well, I guess because- How is Burry connecting those dots? Well, I guess he's say, is, is saying, and then you have the equity index fund doing the same uh, to the equity market. But I think what's the point is missing is that just the Fed is distorting the whole asset pricing, uh, yeah. pricing of yeah. everything, not just credit. It's just- uh, so I guess it's really the impact the Fed is having is on all assets, all assets, all asset pricing, including equities and including index funds. I but think. see, this is the this is the thing that is so interesting to me. And and Day and Brian and I have had some conversations with some of the leading money managers in Wall Street about this face to face. It, 
it is that a the thing we're talking about here with index funds if there is a story it strikes me that we're talking about it in the wrong asset class that it's far more potentially lethal in fixed income oh. credit than it is in equities. I agree. Oh, yeah. I mean, the prices are much more directly set by central bank policy than you could say an index fund or passive investment strategy sets stock prices or valuations. Because they, the stock prices and valuations, you can analyze, they trade freely, all those sorts of things. When you got a central bank that takes rates down to zero, that sets rates. And that, that adjusts immediately credit markets. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's just more direct. And so there's much more of a distortion in that market or a potential for one. There's no price discovery. Yeah, so, I mean, Italian bond yields are the same as the U.S. Yeah, there, well, there, also, there you go. <laughs> when, do, when do bonds trade? They trade OTC for the most part, right? And you, if you have a liquid ETF tied to a bond index that's trading intraday, I think Gunlock actually brought it up a while ago. I won't give him all the credit for it. I think other people talk first, but that that could be a potential problem. I would say, and that comes full circle actually. So we would go back to uh, passive investing and indexes and ETFs in general. I would say your question is it systemic risk on those types of things? I said no. But on fixed income or non-liquid assets, gold or, or you know muni bonds or things like that, that really don't change hands very much. If you're trading an ETF, you know intraday millions of shares of volume, mm -hmm. where's really the price discovery there? Could there be a dislocation in there? And I've always felt that way. It's never really played out that way, but it's always been a fear of mine. Yeah, yeah I, I I agree with that. I think the if you look at the underlying basket of a lot of these uh, bond ETFs. Many of those bonds won't trade for weeks. Yeah, yeah. So if there's ever a situation where and, and there's Two ways Some of them ETS have never get... traded since the primary issuance in like, the municipal right. sector. Right. Build, build America bonds, mean? No. Yeah. So, so, so pretty. You're you're talking about pretty illiquid uh, underlying securities, and there's different ETFs can trade on the secondary market. Where it, uh, an example is a retail investor buying an ETF from another retail investor, or if there's uh, an a, an overabundance of selling, then they sell on the primary market, and the underlying basket has to be redeemed. So those bonds. So essentially. Uh, it, it introduces forced selling of those underlying securities in the marketplace, which can lead to significant mispricing. And if you own uh, an ETF like that, you, there is uh, there is risk there. So, but I think I think that what Julian said earlier was important. Is is the risk anything more than one day volatility risk? That, like I think we saw in February of 2018, in December of 2018, you had some really exaggerated selling pressure. It starts off fundamentally driven. Markets don't trade down for no reason. So let's just assume it might have sure. had, I don't know, something to do with Trump and a tweet and trade. Are we going to just pretend? Sure. Okay. So the market starts selling. And you're down 500. You settle down 500 for a couple hours. Then all of a sudden, final hour, you jump down 800. It's unprovable. It's unknowable. But it's reasonable to assume part of the additive selling pressure is ETFs having to square away the trading books near the end of the day. True or false? Mm -hmm. I think it's true. Yeah, it's, I would say it's true. It does, it does speak to. I don't know if this is what Michael Burry was talking about, but the, there could be an inherent flaw in that you're you're basically decreasing the cost of capital to a lot of companies who don't deserve it to be where it's at. But through this through this passive and index fund, maybe that's where he was going with it. You know, when a comp when certain companies can raise junk bonds at, at four and five percent at will in the marketplace, that's speaks to trouble to me. I think junk bond market, you know, high yield bonds, yeah. I think that, you know, that'd be cost of capital. But as far as, you know, equities and things, I don't think that that would correlate the same way. But maybe well, you're, in credit you're, markets. You're popping PEs and therefore decreasing the cost yeah. of capital. But that's not, creating, but that's, you know, that's not creating more capital But I don't think that's the, the passive company. money that put, yeah. that decided the PE of these companies. That's the that's the Fed at one and a half percent. And that's, you know, active managers who are doing the trading and decided that these stocks are growing uh, was 20 times PE or the S&Ps were 70 times PE. Mm -hmm. And then the passive buy what's in the index. Mm -hmm. There's a real yeah. non sequitur around assuming that index buying is affecting the market multiple. We've had PEs higher than this for a sustained period of time, many, Before. many times in market history when there was no such thing as ETFs. Very true. Yeah. I mean, uh, how did we get to a 29 times S&P in, in early 2000? There wasn't even such thing as an ETF where the spider SPY was yeah. just starting off. Yeah. Sure. I, I, think, I think it strikes me... I will say this. Actually, who was the guy who played Michael Burry in the movie? I think it was Christian, Christian, Bale. Christian Bale. Christian Bale. He was. It was a great performance. Yeah. The books were interesting. I've heard Michael Burry speak uh, on a number of occasions. I like him uh, from everything I've seen. But listen, I have a big problem when people. There's a couple of things that are warning signals to me. Something like, "Oh, this is the new CDO." Yeah. Whenever someone says, "This is the new Lehman," okay, 
I was on CNBC the day that Brexit passed and the Financial Times editor saying, I think Brexit represents the I new Lehman. And I thought, well, I don't know. I sure I remember Lehman a lot differently than you do, apparently. It was, um, so my, uh, my, I can promise you the restaurants were a lot more crowded in New York the day after Brexit than they were the day after Lehman. <laughs> Very true. The, the reality is that the dramatizing of yeah, it is sort of yeah. a turnoff. And yet yeah. you don't want to miss a point that could be a good point just because you think someone is sensationalizing something. Well said. Yeah. But my, my theory on it is that we're, we're on the right track here. If there's a story to talk about, he's talking about the wrong one. It's sort of like your building's on fire because there's arsonists that are lighting a building on fire. And then you write a story on how the sprinklers in the back exit number 14 aren't working and you're worried about systemic risk on the sprinkler. It's right. like, well, yeah, but also there's this other thing. And, and, I, and I don't believe that we have a fire. But I, I just use that as a kind of reasonable analogy. My point being the central bank issue is 10 times the story, 100 times the story this is. You, now, Julian, what, what what else did you unpack from this that you thought is noteworthy? No, that that's why I wanted to to, to address that point because I guess uh, you know everybody focusing on the on the passive indexing, but I, he was mentioning as well the central banks, and I think to me it's a much bigger issue. Uh, you know, uh, the fact that uh, they remove, I mean, basically they're forcing you to invest and they're removing price discovery, and that's I think to me that's much more ring that the fact that whether or not now we had forty percent of passive investing. Um, instead of like, yeah, it was much less than that 10 years ago. Um, it changed the market structure, but, you know, I guess valuation are, 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 haven't been impacted. And um, I think the market looks like it's been efficient. And so I don't see really a problem there. Well, let's, let's do our listeners a huge favor here. The five of us, I think, are pretty sober-minded guys. We have a philosophy we believe in about the market. Um, Day, I hope it was okay. I said sober-minded after your weekend. You were having trouble remembering no, it. I was just sailing. <laughs> <laughs> but to me, to me, I think listeners really deserve to hear what we're, we're about to share. There is a phenomena that takes place that I am convinced is toxic is is toxic for regular investors for where where people that don't necessarily have a hyper sophisticated level of depth in a given subject are provided just enough vocabulary to sort of create a kind of brain signal response that is fearful like okay this doesn't sound good Yet there's no real connecting of dots. No one explains why this A, which involves B, is going to lead to C, and C is supposed to be a horrible thing. It's not even necessary for the, the person making the argument, whether it's media or a fear-mongering market actor. They don't even need to connect dots because they know it's, in, it's unnecessary as long as you just create the appearance of something that sounds bad. There are people that will sort of run with it. There's entire websites <laughs> that sort of run around this stuff. They can put up a chart, and, and there's one, I don't actually want to say the name, I, I don't think we're not allowed to do, but I'm just not going to. But there's one, you'll share a lot of the content from them, and I've been reading them for years. Mm -hmm. The proprietor of the site refuses to use his own, own name. Yeah. Uh, cutesy hides behind a, a movie a character name. But they'll sometimes put up a big chart, and the chart is accurate. It's correct. They'll go, oh, oh, so you know, C CDS spreads blow out to this level last scene. And go, oh, okay, but there's absolutely no logic behind why the thing they're sharing with the size headline and everything is supposed to mean something bad. And I think <laughs> listeners need to know they're being played. Yeah, they're they're th this is not unintentional. They are purposely knowing people don't understand the mechanics. High mm -hmm. frequency trading. Do you think, Brian? that the reporting about the world of high-frequency trading has been intellectually honest? No, I do not. <laughs> I mean, you, well, is that it, a good it, it example? Sounds, yeah, it, it is a good example. It's, it's something that most people don't fully understand, and you can have statistics and charts to prove almost any point, given a particular period of time and or you know what you're doing, and you can get a sensationalistic headline and or it drives, drives clicks on whatever you're doing, and it's selling, and... And honestly, it's the same thing sometimes that some of the media companies do as well on TV. You know, I mean, but I think like, with, the with all the graphics now, with like no. markets down five hundred, you've got like a flaming, burning mm -hmm. sign of yeah. the like, S and P yeah. five hundred, and it's kind of the same same idea. But but it's all it's all it, you know that's cartoon. It's a cartoon. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's literally a cartoon. I think that this commentary around all this stuff and the machines are about to be the the example I'm going to really elaborate on. It's cartoonish coverage. 
there is this narrative. I see it with intelligent people, grown adults, and they'll be like, oh, man, you see what the machines did to us today. Yeah. I go, so the market was down, and they go, the machines are taking over and this and that. And they have this view that, like, the market should have been down 220 points, but it was down 700 because this computer got involved. And and I'll try to point out, well, there could be some inefficiencies. There, there's, like, trade errors. Like, people forget flash crash was literally like a mistake. Yeah. Okay. There could be fraud. There's things that could happen. But this idea that like that, that we're all sitting around kind of just mercilessly subject to computers that are doing us harm is the dumbest damn thing I've ever heard. Yeah. And I'm tired of investors being scared by people who do know better and don't mm -hmm. care. Dale, what say you? Yeah, I think all those headlines and sensationalizing is doing exactly what it's intended to do is as as you guys perfectly summed up, is that's to draw eyeballs. I mean, most of these people are, I assume they're doing it for some sort of eyeballs draw and profit, and it's doing exactly that. Uh, as far as uh, investors, I th look, I think the market is, uh, what you see, what the Dow does, the S&P does, is essentially the culmination of uh, millions of different uh, market participants all pursuing their own self-interest. Yep. And to try to make sense of exactly what, why something went up 600 points or 500 points, sure, there may, may, may be some broad uh, theme that's going on, but it's, I think it's a bit crazy to assume to know that it's because of some machine. I, I, it's, a, it's, it's just rank oversimplification that I, I think is really dangerous. Dave, did you read my book, Crisis of Responsibility? I did. <laughs> Do you remember my second chapter where I talked about the kind of boogeyman that we create in society and people will say Wall Street, sure. but it's really broad in general. Others on the right might say government or the Fed or there, there, there's different kind of targets of our ire. But it, the higher level, the better, because the, le the more specificity, the more you have to defend your position, the less specificity, the more you can get away with just saying general and, and pretty unhelpful things. Mm -hmm. I think that that point I was making in the book, which was more of a cultural commentary, applies to this. The, why blame it on a computer? Because you don't have to – it's mm -hmm. perfectly it's a great opaque. Yep. Yeah. Oh, a computer. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I don't understand everything about computers. Yeah. I, it, it, yeah. <laughs> they just happen to be providing yeah. like all of the liquidity for the market. And to your point with the volumes, how they've gone up over the years, I mean that's what they've done. They've increased liquidity. Yeah. Is that a yeah. bad thing? Mm. I don't think it what is. Was, when you and I, I first liquidity started – liquidity is good. When, I, I mean you were a little bit after me, but early on uh, you, you were probably in your third or fourth year and I was in my fourth or fifth year. Warren Buffett had a famous line called Weapons of Mass Destruction, and he was not referring to uh, Iraq, Saddam Hussein, 9-11. He was referring to what financial instrument? Uh, was it a derivative? Derivative. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Who's the largest holder of derivatives? <laughs> yeah, right. Yes, exactly. It was Buffett, right? Sure. But here's my point. Why did that have a 100% chance of succeeding? It was a Fortune magazine article. It had uh, Buffett, you know, God forbid mm -hmm. anyone ever question what the Oracle of Omaha says about mm -hmm. anything. Well, no one knew what the hell a derivative and no meant. One knew what yeah. it was. <laughs> no one knew what it was. It's, it's and it just that. said, oh, there's trillions of dollars. It sounds terrible. And here's the worst part. Then people took a victory lap in 08. They go, see, those derivatives did kill us. Yeah. I go, yeah, it might have been what they were invested in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I think I think that that's an example of this fear mongering that I think is really unhelpful. But, yeah, very much so. Why do, why do all the hard root level work to really try to understand something where you can just take a headline like that and run with it and assume that yeah. the world is exactly that, you know? So, so yeah, so uh, I totally I totally agree. A lot of fear mongering, but, just running with headlines that uh, that people shouldn't be running with. I was going to say, like, isn't it then the biggest risk of passive investing? I think for the in investor is like not knowing what you own. So you really yeah. want to make sure you take the time of understanding what you own because I guess the difference is like you invest with us, you know, study stocks, you know, we're holding your hand. If you buy the S&P 500, but, but Joe, let me take to... the other side of it, even though I agree with you 100%. Yeah. So I got to do something right now I don't do often, which pretend I don't sure. believe, I, I believe something different. The counter argument is that's a plus for index funds. Oh, the good thing is you don't know what you own. You're, you're less susceptible to human error. Sure. And that human decision making is a negative alpha contributor. And therefore, by not knowing and being hands off, that you have a better chance of a, a superior investment result. That would be their argument. Well, I'd say like, yeah, it's probably, you know, not going to worry as long as, you know, you make money every year, the market goes up, but the moment you're going to have like a recession or crisis and you're going to be down 20% on your statement and you're going to see one line and, and you don't know what, what you own, you're going to be worried and 
why, why are you going to turn to what to understand whether it, you want to hold it or feel comfortable sleeping well at <laughs> night, not knowing what you own? So I think, mm -hmm. I mean, if you own the S&P 500, there's nothing wrong about it, but you really need to know what you own. I, I, I totally agree. As far as the, and there's a distinction between a vehicle that's constructed passively and the way that vehicle is being implemented in your investment strategy. You can be pursuing a hyper-aggressive active strategy, but be invested in solely index funds. Yeah. By jumping out of it, either you're jumping in one sector ETF and you have some some sector rotation strategy, or you're you're timing you're trying to time the S and P. So there's a distinction between a, a you investing in a passive vehicle and uh, a passive investing strategy. And I, I mean, I would jump Completely. in and just say, at the end of the day, how does an index solve someone's what they're trying to accomplish? Right. I mean, it's an index. And right. it's, it's an okay investment vehicle. It's beta. It's how you get, you know, and I have no problem with any of it. But for most people that are investing money for a certain reason, probably to save money for retirement or produce an income that they can depend and live off of, is the index something that's really going to scratch that itch? Is it going to check that box? Is it really going to to accomplish that goal? And I would say that it, that it usually does not. And so we want to be intentional and own things that are attributable to an actual result we're trying to achieve, not just to mimic something else, which is a market cap weighted index. So, Robert, is the sensation around index funds uh, post-2008 driven by the fact that uh, our friends at Strategas call financial repression, that the Fed, with three rounds of QE and with ZERP, effectively made it very easy for passive investing to outperform active? That's kind of been a golden period for for passive investing. I always think back to the the what was it the Warren Buffett bet against that hedge fund manager, yeah. which asset class would would outperform. You know, I think it's done a lot to increase the allure of passive investments, but in a long term, you know, Fed Fed easing world and Fed easy world, I, I don't know that that's going to change in the near future. I, I think the dislocations will become more evident. You know, some of the things we've talked about today, um, but I think you know people won't people won't realize the the flaws in passive and in index investing until it's kind of too late, till they see their, you know, their statements down 20 plus percent and they don't know what they own. I think those will be the, the problem periods, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. Brian, do you believe that um, our concern about index, uh, about passive vehicles, let's call it ETFs in particular, that um, it, we're right to want to avoid buying high yield bonds through uh, ETF or municipal bonds through an ETF? Uh, in terms of their ability in a market disruption to function smoothly. So I, I do I do agree with that. I mean, we we want to own just like we would own individual equities, individual stocks. We would want to own individual bonds and or specific sectors and be intentional about what we own. When you own an ETF of a bond index of some kind, um, I don't want to say it's make believe, but it's there's a lack of price discovery there if the underlying assets within the index are not trading hands. You mm -hmm. don't really know what the price is. I, I think they're. So far, so good. They have not blown up. There's They're not, marked to a matrix of equal durations and coupons. Yeah, mm -hmm. which which is okay. I think in most markets it'll be fine. So, and you get big so Third Avenue was an open right. end mutual fund yeah. of high of even more illiquid assets, and it blew up. Yeah, is that just a difference of degree, or is it a difference of kind? And and just so I don't I avoid putting you in a tough position, I will say I will show the ball. I believe it was a difference of degree. That that's essentially what could happen, but hasn't yet happened with some even more traditional fixed income assets. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, I think the Third Avenue th thing was pretty specific to what they were doing in, in, inside of that fund. But the same thing could happen in the ETF market. The one thing I would say is that we went through in 08. And, and if there's a good stress test for anything, I think, in the financial markets to see what happens when it all you know, mm -hmm. goes the wrong way. That that's a pretty good environment, and those funds did function through there. There was dislocations for sure. Okay. You had flash well, crash, but one for but the high yield. Uh, I'm, we won't go into tickers, but uh, the leading high yield ETFs had one fifth the assets under yeah. management good in point. a weight that they have now. Yep, it's a great point. I mean, it, we don't own them for those reasons. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I I don't want to be a doomsayer either, and you know, we're not trying to sell advertising here, so I'm just trying to speak the truth with it, but. Um, if just think intuitively about what they are. It's something that trades every day, millions of shares, mm -hmm. and the stuff that's inside of it doesn't trade for weeks. So there you go. There's a little disconnect there. So, so uh, Julian, we um, have talked about this in the past in Divin Cafe, and we've had client events around this. Um, the fact of the matter is that the way ETFs get settled every day, you know, I was saying how a lot of just people out there don't know how computers work and high frequency works and this and that. How many people you think understand how the pricing gets set in their ETF and how the market makers, uh, the securities involved, 
said a lot. Would you guess it's a pretty low percentage of people understand it? Yeah, probably. I would think so because most people don't understand the the you know the uh, all the dynamics, so all the the thing that happened behind in the background, your know, back office, and all the training. So creation it's, industry. It's yeah. So we are. I would like to say investment professionals. We do this for a living. We trade in millions of shares of securities, usually on a daily basis. We're responsible for the stewardship of effectively a couple billion dollars of assets. We don't even know exactly how the pricing gets done on some of those bond ETFs at the end of the day because it isn't shared publicly. Mm -hmm. There's a complete lack of transparency. So to your point earlier about knowing what you own, I would add there's a great point and great benefit that you brought up in people knowing what they own. But there's also a great benefit in knowing how it got to be there, how it functions. There is no ability for someone to fully understand it. Now, you can take it on faith. Most of the time, that probably works out. Yeah. But I think that there is a significant enough amount of money that people are having to take on faith in some of these more uh, idiosyncratic asset classes. S&P 500, big cap companies, FANG, I don't really care. I don't yeah. think there's systemic risk mechanically in the indexing of that product. But on this bond side, I think it's a big deal. Yeah, yeah I, would, I would agree. Robert, you brought up a point. I'm going to let you comment first, and I want to see if anyone disagrees. F uh, a threat to capitalism because of the large ownership that some of the big ETF makers might have. Talk about that. Yeah, so when people think about ownership of, let's just say, stocks, right, you're entitled to some of the res residual earnings, right? But you also get to vote on certain corporate matters as an individual or, you know, trust holder of those shares. When you hold shares perhaps indirectly through an ETF, you know, some of the, the big names we all know, you, you essentially delegate a lot of your voting power via proxies to those those big names, right? And as the 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 growth in, you know, delegation of votes has increased over time, you, you really you delegate it to the ETF provider. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah, right. Generally yeah. speaking, there's gonna be a box you check on, you know, something mm -hmm. or you sign it away, so to speak. Um, but you're essentially giving or providing voting power to a couple big entities in the marketplace, mm -hmm. right? And the decisions that those entities make, you know, certainly they're going to be sometimes and hopefully largely around, you know, increasing profitability, increasing returns for the, the holders of, of their securities. But sometimes they're driven by other factors as well. I mean, we, we hear about, and this is, you know, depending on your perspective, good or bad, but you hear about divestiture from certain types of assets, whether it's petroleum, oil and gas, things like that. When you're, when you're making and placing votes on the basis of perhaps your own philosophical priorities, and it's not intended to be to the to the benefit of the underlying holders of your, your ETF or whatever product, that can be bad for the holders of those products. And you can also be delegating, you know, philosophical votes to people that you don't agree with necessarily, or you could vehemently disagree with them. No, but isn't that true if you have an active money manager? It, it, it would be, right? Yeah. Yeah. Would be. So, so are you critical of the whole concept of proxy voting, or are you critical of, in this case, that the person with the proxy has a different objective than what's best for underlying I'm, shareholders. I'm certainly not critical of proxy voting because I think there's an efficiency component to it. And most people don't even know that that is a concept that exists, right? So I think bringing awareness to it is would be my intent. Um, but also, I think there are a lot of, of folks out there who would, if they knew about this, would disagree strongly with the votes that are being placed at corporate board levels across industries. By Around social a lot issues of, as opposed to— It can to... be social. A, a big one these days is environmental, of course, yeah. as well. But how does that affect your long-term returns down the road? Yeah. So, so I'm in 100% agreement with Robert here. I'm going to go to you and have a couple other questions for the guys before we wrap up on this. However, I would argue that within capitalistic structure, we have the antidote to the concern that Robert has, which is competition from other ETFs. Competition from other ETFs, and remember the you know their market cap weighted too. So the pools of those big companies are very large, you know. And and but I I, I would say this, I would agree with you, Robert. I, I do think that that's an interesting point. I don't think people talk about it a whole lot. I mean, at least I haven't seen it a lot, and it's very when interesting. they talk about it, they're talking for it. Yeah, they're mm -hmm. talking about. It's Andrew Ross Sorkin writing an op-ed saying how um, a particular ETF maker can go force companies to quit mm. selling ammunition or something yeah, like yeah. that. Yeah, so, so, so a power of ch for change. In the yeah, they're, they're not talking about the concern environment. of it. They're talking yeah. about the opportunity of yeah, well, using— it, it cuts both ways. It does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, Julian, do you see this as something that will grow as a issue, or do you think that uh, we're overthinking it? Um, the the voting issue and and the idea that it uh, could end up having a disproportionate impact in the boardroom shareholder voting it could alter the dynamics mm. of what shareholder votes are intended okay. to do. Well, 
I I don't have enough data on that. I, I first time I hear. I mean, I I thought coming in today that it was neutral. Uh, you know, whether it's an active manager or passive manager, they still have fiduciary duty to their holders, and they I, w- I didn't think it would make a difference. Maybe it does. But I think having in general, I guess what you want is shareholder voting because a lot of the boards really um, there's not a lot of challenge from shareholders uh, at the end of the day mm-hmm. to what the board decides. So whether it's active or passive, what you want is that people vote. And I think, and uh, that's you know, I think that's most important. That like um, they don't necessarily approve all the resolutions that uh, you know proposed. Uh, and it looks like uh, these days where investors are a bit more you know responsible with their votes. And if you have more concentration, that could be a good thing. That these big funds they have more influence uh, on what uh, corporates uh, do and uh, can do. Mm. So, Dea, what's a bigger threat to free market capitalism? This subject of ETF representation and shareholder votes, or Senator Elizabeth Warren? <laughs> I, I would go with the latter. Uh, Those I mean, that are laughing, by the way, <laughs> appear to not be taking the threat as seriously as perhaps oh. the chief investment officer of the Bonsa Group is. Uh, the latter. You yeah, said yeah. That right. yeah I, would, I would definitely go with the latter. As far as the does ETFs, it feel like I was leading the witness there a little? <laughs> As far as the voting as ETFs go, I I do I think it is a risk. The more pe- the more uh, there's uh, degrees of separation between the who the end uh, investor that actually owns the shares and the management. I think that creates uh, a bit of uh, an issue there. As far as but, but yeah, hold on, isn't there a difference a, a, a issue yeah. of degree like? Most individual investors, then they put up a slate of names for the board of directors and ask you to vote. Most are very accustomed to saying, hey, I'm gonna, I want to proxy my vote to the money to, manager because you guys are doing re- research on Bill Smith and his sure. pedigree on this board. And I don't know Todd Johnson, so they're trusting that. It, so that part we'd be okay with, but then it's when the, the proxy starts, as Robert brought up, implementing a kind of social agenda that might not be in the economic best interest of the shareholder. Right. Not all proxy voting is created equal. Okay. I'm sure I'm yeah. sure that obviously our clients are aligned uh, uh, in more ways than just uh, us trying to being responsible for their uh, for their financial goals. It's more uh, morals and yeah. ethics and all that mm-hmm. and all that stuff. So I'm sure we see the world the, the, similarly as a lot of our clients. But as far as the proxy voting, and I don't know to the extent that, uh, and we, and we can say the names of some of the largest passive uh, providers out there, which is Vanguard, BlackRock, State Street. Mm-hmm. To the extent uh, what their social agenda is, I can't I I can't really say. I assume that most of the time they're voting alongside management. Well, uh, I haven't so. seen the data. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I'm not I'm not exactly sure. So I think I think it creates the potential for some risks down the road. But but right now I haven't really seen it manifest. I I can't speak to it I, currently. Yeah. Well, it's something that I think Warren's continuing to watch. I think it may be that right now the threat is not that you have an example of a premier um, passive uh, ownership vehicle voting against their shareholders, but you have set the table for them to be widely influenced by cultural influencers. And and so you can get an op-ed in the yes, New York Times where I they're agree. where they're telling him you better go you know stand up to the this or the that or whatever the kind of PC thing of the day is some of the causes may, we might be really sympathetic towards Could be. and yeah. other and again there are people that would hear everything we're saying and saying exactly do that like they would say this is good hmm. I think that it warrants continuing monitoring and I, agree. I, I don't personally if I viewed my ownership of equities as something by which I wanted to have a degree of cultural influence, I can't imagine wanting to be in a passive vehicle and saying, I don't know the people at XYZ ETF company, but I bet they're going to go represent my conscience. Mm. I would think I'm going to vote my shares, my conscience and whatnot. So you could add as well, I mean, you have to think that there's also the active active managers, um, you know, would take uh, activists, actually, I wanted to say. Mm. So Look, I mean, now you've had campaigns and some people, they take just one, two, three percent. And with three percent of in a company, you really can't influence theoretically. There's not much you can do to um, <laughs> to influence the board. But because of, they are like uh, famous investors or because, you know, they, you know, they um, boards are worried of when these guys show up. With three percent, you manage to 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 uh, to push some uh, changes. I mean, we've seen some. But see, I really, uh, I examples. really generally, I I really tend to fall in on the side of the activist investors in those cases, because I believe that there is a 
price to being a publicly traded company that you you but when you decide to trade your equity in the public market someone forced you to do that you have funding mechanisms mm-hmm. you actually have highly sophisticated mm-hmm. private equity funding in our society mm-hmm. you choose to go in the public equity markets and receive certain benefits and liquidity and transparency and price discovery in doing that um, one of the downsides is now your shareholders have an input in how you run the company now mm-hmm. you set your board up the way you set it up you have voting percentages the way you do but if an activist investor is coming in and saying, hey, we disagree with strategy, management, we want to talk to you and engage with you because we like this idea better than that idea, I think that they have the right to do it. Management has the right to disagree, and there's processes that work around that. If all the activist investor is trying to do is manipulate the stock for a trade, I, I'm not crazy about that. But if most of the famous activist uh, endeavors of the last 10 years, and it's become a very big deal, and we're, of course, invested in some activist-oriented hedge fund strategies, Mm -hmm. if all of a sudden the activist was coming up and saying, we want to make a big public stink, but it's not about capital allocation, it's not about strategy, it's it's not about, um, you know, potential M&A that they're either critical of or fond of, it's about some social attribute. Like we, we're becoming activist investor because we want them to have more recognition of this, that, or that. I think that becomes very distortive to markets, and it, and, it, and it confuses the role of who's supposed to be doing what in capital markets. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I think to, to, the, to your point, an activist investor, like you said, we've invested with some of them. We know who they are. <clears throat> there's usually a profit motive there. I mean, they're going in to reshape the business. They want to make it well, better. Well, there's always the, a profit the, motive. You there. know, the, the, it's, it's capitalism at its finest. When you have the ETF side, do they really care about I mean, they, they have a fiduciary obligation yeah. to shareholders, for sure, of their ETF, yes. Do they care as much? Do they have as much direct skin in the game of real ownership of a company that's in their ETF? They technically don't, right? Yeah. Whether they own that company in the top seventh holding or their 27th holding, eh, they get their basis points on the fee anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So, you're exactly right. And that's the slippery slope. Yeah. Yeah, and as far as uh, what you were saying about capitalism, any any time you are forcing social responsibility, and I'm sure everybody has, it's one of those things that everybody has a different definition of. Anytime you're forcing social responsibility on a company, you're reducing freedom of that company, and that's obviously that's against the very core tenet of capitalism, which is, uh, you know, everybody's allowed to pursue, pursue their uh, self-interest. A so. really uh, quick rule of thumb I'll help close this out with, whenever someone's Efforts and social responsibility start with a press release. Be skeptical. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Many good things come from people working behind the scenes. Very few good things come from people trying to get a trophy for it. Just remember, Mm -hmm. there's a biblical precedent here, by the way. Yeah, very very true. All right, guys, anything else on the issue of index investing as we wrap up? So uh, I'll I'll start. So I am a proponent. I'm a fan of index fund investing. I feel like it's done a lot to... Enrich, enrich investors as far as providing investors with very cheap beta. It's something that you should be very, the, the listeners out there that do trade ETFs, be careful when you're trading them, especially in environments where there's gyration. There can be a, how that ETF trades during that day can be a little funky. Set limits, be careful when you're trading in and out of these things, especially if it's a new ETF. There's been explosion in ETFs around, uh, you have an ETF out there, uh, uh, video gaming, artificial intelligence, crypto. Uh, I mean, there are all sorts of niches being created for these ETFs. Wait, so, you're so calling niches, careful. I'm calling fads. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, so if it's new, the more boring, the better for the ETF. But if it's if it's a new type of ETF, be very, very careful when, uh, when getting in and out of these things. So. Excellent comments, no. Robert. No, I, I I would agree with everything Daya said. I think um, they're good for a lot of folks, specifically people that are in you know retirement plans, things like that, that just want access to a market with a very easy uh, way to get that. Uh, they can be dangerous, so just be wary of um, the ability to trade them so frequently and the the knowledge that sometimes ETFs and these deep specializations can really prey upon the worst aspects mm. of uh, human behavioral. Absolutely. Right. No, I mean, I would say, yep, uh, ETFs, and the, the, this is, we're kind of painting a broad stroke here. ETFs can mean a lot of things. We talked about bonds, we talked stocks, can be different sectors, different asset classes, um, the whole thing. But generally, I mean, I think they did serve a great purpose, but are they, do you own them for a specific reason? So I think if you just own them because you want to just have your money go up and down with the whim of how the world turns and how markets trade, I guess that's great, but I don't know how that really accomplishes a certain goal. So I would just be mindful of what you're trying to accomplish. Beta is beta, meaning that you're going to go up and down with the stock market. Is that what you're trying to accomplish with your financial goals? Excellent. 
I would say, you know, index funds, they are not toxic. Uh, you know, what creates bubbles and, and crashes, it's human nature. So it's, that's what you have to protect yourself against is your own human nature. Oh, Julian, that is like yeah. music to my soul. <laughs> this is what we've been. Uh, I mean, how long did it take him to get acclimated into the DNA of the Bonson Group? <laughs> He's exactly right. It is the great closing thought here. The behavioral uh, tendencies of investors uh, are our friend and mentor, Nick Murray, constantly says that human nature is a failed investor. And that is the thing that has to be guarded against most. There could be articles that come up here and there, usually on blogs, usually on social media, want to fear you, scare you about this or that or the other. At the end of the day, um, the reality is that we have far bigger fish to fry than some of the potential mechanical um, inadequacies that exist in some aspects of investment product. And I will close with the benefits to these ETF vehicles of intraday trading are no benefit at all to someone who's investing the right way. You do not need money at 1030 in the morning that you can't get to at one o'clock in the afternoon for a person who's properly allocated and investing around an investment policy in conjunction with an advisor who set a financial plan and so forth and so on. The, the, the risk that comes from such intraday issues are real and mechanical around certain asset classes like high yield and municipal and things of that nature. But fundamentally, we believe that transparency is the investor's friend, and we think alignment of interest, working with an advisor, having an individual product that you know what you own and why you own it works much better. So a lot of behavioral stuff we covered this week. I love the fact we got to get into ideology of markets, um, some of the kind of social and cultural components. Um, I got to plug my own uh, book in here somewhere, but it really happened organically. I wasn't looking for some kind of plug there. And, of course, you see an alignment and a real shared passion with these uh, other four gentlemen around the table with me uh, to do the right thing for our clients and give you more uh, and constantly improving information. Reach out with any questions anytime. Write a review for Dividend Cafe. We'll send you a copy of our Dividend Growth book. Thank you for listening to the Dividend Cafe. 